This is the Cordial Catholic, but this week we're pulling no punches. If you want the straight dope of what the Catholic Church believes about gender, sexuality, how we should respond to things like gender identity, and the current way the world is working out these things, how, how we as Catholics, should walk alongside in those kinds of journeys, cutting through all kinds of, dare I say, crap, crap from within the church, crap from all corners of different places, different warring factions and voices, and uh, putting all that aside and walking in this as a Catholic person who cares. This is the interview for you. Dr. Abigail Favalli is an expert in this field. She's a bona fide Catholic. She speaks so well, articulates things brilliantly and gives us here a beautiful picture of what it means to be Catholic and wrestle with these things. This is a fantastic episode. I say the C word, crap, near the end. Heads up. It's a great one. Please watch and enjoy. Hey friends, thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Thank you for listening. If you're listening on podcast, thank you. Welcome. We're also on YouTube at youtube.com slash the cordial cat. If you want to watch for some reason what you're listening to, that'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, on either platform, make sure you hit the subscribe button and on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, please leave a rating or review. That helps to push the podcast out to new people and everyone needs more of Abigail Favalli in their lives. <laughs> Let's be honest. Uh, I am I am joined by Dr. Abigail Favalli. She is a professor at the McGrath Institute for Church Life at the University of Notre Dame. Congrats, by the way. Thanks. The author of Into the Deep, a wonderful exploration of her conversion to Catholicism, and for our purposes here today, the genesis of gender out from Ignatius Press. Uh, Dr. Favalli, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for being here, and yeah. hello. Hi. I should say welcome back to the show. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. this. But I do. I do. Good golly. I looked back in the archives and I had to keep scrolling back because it was episode 18 of the show about 150 wow. episodes ago, three, three and a half years ago wow. that you were on this program, which, which feels like, I don't know, we're getting old or I'm getting old or my memory is, is not working or something. Uh, you had, I think, just written an article for, actually, I think I, I think I got in touch with you before the article came out, and it came out between getting in touch with you and you appearing on the show, which is my luck, uh, for, the, for the Church Life Journal at Notre Dame about gender and sexuality. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I first read that article and it started getting passed around in the circles that, that I kind of associate with, thinking, wow, somebody has finally kind of put words to what we as Catholics believe and why it's beautiful and why it makes sense and why it is such a contrast to some of the things that other people in the world, the, 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 the current kind of ethos or, or, or zeitgeist or the paradigm is saying, you made so much sense of that for us. And I remember just passing that along and, and for a long time, and even I stink, I, even I stink, that's true. But even <laughs> I think as recently as like last month, somebody asked me for a good explanation of, of gender and sexuality from the, mm. the Catholic perspective. And I went back and found your article and passed it along again because it was just so poignant. This book has expanded on those, those ideas and those themes. Uh, and we have to say thank you for doing that because the work you are doing, I think, singularly is is not being done in a lot of places. You're mm -hmm. you're 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 clear. You're articulate. You're you're Catholic. You're funny. You're you're ready to throw some punches. Uh, pull some punches. <laughs> I don't know. Depends punch, on the day. <laughs> punch punch people. I guess <laughs> maybe this is the wrong show for that. Yeah, anyway, I don't know. I'm very cordial <laughs> most of the time. That's good. I don't know. Well, thank you. Thank you for all your work. I want to say, and I I want to know. I wonder if you can begin by kind of outlining. Because you aren't just some some slow schlum slow schlum, gosh, it's gonna be a long show, Abby. I'm sorry. <laughs> totally fine. Why am I calling you Abby? We're not like. No, you should good. call me Abby. Should I? It, yes, it, because it makes me feel awkward. I'm okay. like, I'm gonna close out all the windows of my browser yeah. just to make sure I'm all not. Right. I've become one of those like hoarder browser window yeah, people. Yeah. Okay, there we okay. go. Abby, no, yeah, hoarding. please do call. <laughs> I, I, <know. laughs> I don't know you that well to call you. I'm yeah, anyway. It's fine. Now, now I do. I just this is that. this is my second appearance. Yeah, sure, I feel yeah. like you know what that's can, true. Yeah, I you know, know even way back when. Look, like you, you know, came on the you show know me when, before COVID. Yeah, yeah before that. Really? Wow. That's yeah. That's how long yeah. ago it was. Yeah. My goodness. Wow. 
Okay, we have changed a lot, haven't we, since then? We go way back. My, my mm -hmm. goodness. All right, so I want to know, because what I was trying to say is you, you have credentials in this field. You're not just some person who's walked up the street to begin opening up a YouTube channel and commenting on these things as some people out there are, are doing and, and have done. You are in this space, writing about this space, researching, the, researching this space, doing work in this space, and you've written from a place of knowledge and understanding. So I want to, I want to ask you first of all, to lay out your credentials for us. Okay. <laughs> no. no. Kind of tell us how you how you be began, because the the first part of the book really outlines kind of how you got involved in this and your kind of evolution of thinking, um, thinking through that. And one, where I want you to end, if I can steer you a little bit in this direction, is you, the, the one one theme of this I thought was so interesting is you kind of end the section with this I think maybe or maybe I'm getting the book mixed up but you say feminism led you away from and then toward a deep Christian faith mm -hmm. I think that's that's so interesting so can you kind of take us through that journey a little bit just to give listeners a sense of of who you are and where you're coming from with with mm -hmm. this you know this um this writing on on gender and sexuality and, and those kinds of things yeah sure so I I started getting really into feminist thought in college as an undergraduate. So I was raised an evangelical Protestant. Feminism was not really on the radar. But I was interested in questions of gender. I don't know if I would have used that term back then, but yeah. um, from a young age. And when I encountered feminist thought in college, I thought, oh, this is amazing. I love this. <laughs> you know, I was a philosophy major, but I began to really get into feminist philosophy Um but I also loved women's writing and literature, so it was hard for me to choose. So then I went on an graduate school um, in at, at St. Andrews in Scotland and a master's in women women's writing and gender theory because I thought this will help me decide whether I want to like go straight into sort of feminist philosophy or do more like feminist philosophy and literature. Um, and I loved it. I love the combination of the two. And so I stayed on in that field to do a PhD um, in women's writing and feminist literary criticism. And I worked primarily using French feminist philosophy. So if any of your listeners are familiar with that Gosh. field, like, <laughs> like Lucia Rigore <laughs> was my, my um, main, main um, feminist philosopher that I worked with and actually got to meet her and work with her and I published with her um, as well. So she's quite well known in the Anglo-American world. So, um, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. So, but to kind of loop back to that question, I think initially feminism took me away from my faith because um, I basically, by immersing myself in feminist thought, I kind of adopted this hermeneutics of suspicion, this way of reading everything like reality, but certainly the Bible, certainly tradition through with this suspicious kind of ready to do a scavenger hunt for sexism kind of mentality. And so I think that that disposition became kind of a wall between myself and God, right? Because you can't really trust or love um, someone that you're at root very deeply suspicious of. So that I think put me at odds with Christianity, even though I still considered myself to be a Christian. Um, but the way it led me back was actually getting deeper. This is the in my doctoral work into the thought of Lucia Rigore, this feminist philosopher I mentioned, because she talks a lot about incarnation in her work. She's actually raised Catholic, although, you know, was not practicing or anything, but, but had kind of in her later work returned to Catholicism and looking for some kind of fruitful things within it. And I went on this, I, I went to this seminar with her with 10 other doctoral students from around the world. And at the time I was planning to focus on imagination, this concept of like the, like maybe the theological imagination of women writers, something like that. But instead she was like, no, don't focus on imagination. It's too abstract, like focus on incarnation. Like, there, uh -huh. you know, and, and I was like, Ooh, I like that, you know? And then it <laughs> turns out like that was really, this, you know, focus on incarnation, you know, was one of the primary things that led me toward Catholicism. So, yeah. I thought that's so interesting. I mean, you, you talk in the book about how you kind of, you didn't necessarily, I don't think, leave your evangelical Christianity behind, but you became more and more skeptical of it. And mm -hmm. you were, you were still exploring the edges of that, right? In this, in this work. <clears throat> but then <laughs> I think that's so, so fascinating. I think, I think one of the things that 
uh, that struck me is, I, I think, and maybe I'm getting you entirely wrong, and that's possible. Uh, the thought is, you, we can't, as, as Christians, as Catholics, just reject feminism, right? And say, no, this is not important. This is a, st- a stupid thing. Because for you, that was a thing that brought you back to the faith. That was a real tangible thing. And if we just write that off and say, oh, I have no time for this. If you're a feminist, like, g- goodbye. Sorry, the church isn't a place for you. Mm-hmm. We're not going to try and reach or talk to these people or, or pay attention to them. This is a, a silly thing. There's a whole segment of society that we're not even interacting with. Right? Mm-hmm. Is that is that fair to say? Like, that's yeah, a, a serious I think, thing we have to, we have to grapple yeah, with. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. And I would even maybe even go a step further in that I think ca- as Catholics, we get to be generous toward any system of thought because we can look for what's true and find what's true. And that doesn't mean buying the whole thing. Right. So, you know, like Thomas Aquinas, this was his method. He didn't, he didn't say, Oh, those Islamic philosophers, I'm not going to read them because they don't, you know, believe in the incarnation. Like, no, he, he understood his own faith more deeply by studying Avicenna you know, or Maimonides, the Jewish philosopher, right? So, or the pagan philosophers, of course, Aristotle was like his, his dude. Um, so he wasn't like, I'm not going to read the pagans. So I do think you got to, you got to strike a balance, right? There's, there's either the unthinking acceptance, which I think I did initially, which was not good. But then there's also the knee jerk reaction against like the rejection, just there's nothing of value here, which I, I think is a, is an overreaction. So I, I'm thinking about, because you, you were nominally an evangelical Christian when you began this, but you ended up that kind of journey as, as a Catholic. Uh, the incarnation was, was part of that and studying that. What, I wonder if you could articulate what in the incarnation drew you towards Catholicism versus back to your roots as an evangelical Christian? Like, was there something in there that, as you grapple with that idea and feminism, it wouldn't bring you back to uh, of the, the Bible alone believing evangelical Christianity? Like, what was that that drew you the Catholic faith? Well, I mean, not to, not to throw my dear evangelical friends <laughs> under the bus, but I, I, guess to, I guess I would say that evangelical Christianity is not as incarnational as Catholicism, right? right? I mean, I really think if you, and this isn't even unique to evangelicalism per se, but I think if you kind of step back and look at the things that were rejected in the Reformation by and large, they tend to be the things that are more feminine and more incarnational, the things that have to do more with the body, right? So you have the rejection of the Eucharist and the sacraments, right, which are very bodily and incarnational. You get you have the rejection of Mary. You have the rejection of the church as a visible mother on earth. You have a rejection of the communion of saints. It's, you know, like if you think about when you walk into a Catholic yeah, yeah. space, you're just like, you know, bombarded with bodies. <laughs> it's like there's <laughs> statues everywhere. Yeah. And so I felt like I felt that I felt when I went into a Catholic space, even though I had all these, you know, feminist objections, I, I felt like that it was showing me this fullness of Christianity that I had not encountered as um, growing up evangelical. Like, I think that the, you know, the evangelical churches that I worshiped in, like they had the word, but they didn't have the word made flesh, you know, and that's what I wanted. Yeah. And I guess for me, cause I was, this was a, this was a, a point in question. I didn't do a serious study as you did, but this for me was one of those things I was grappling with as a non-denominational evangelical Christian and I, I found, I don't know if you found the same thing, but there wasn't serious, serious work being done in these areas in the evangelical church. It was kind of, there were, there were, there were books and theologians and, and conferences that kind of presented different pieces of scripture and interpretations of things that would talk about gender and sexuality and say, well, this is why it's condemned because here's, you know, St. Paul says this. But there wasn't kind of the serious work being done or uh, maybe maybe serious body of work to draw on, uh, as there was in, in the Catholic faith. Like there's, that's what I found. When I began just my kind of cursory exploration. So I really couldn't couldn't remain. I mean, even Dogal Christian and answer this question in a way that satisfied me to any real real depth. Did you? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when I began to get interested in feminist and gender questions. Um, Initially, I did so as an evangelical. And so you, the most substances, 
most substantive stuff on offer would be things like the Christians for biblical equality, right? There's kind of egalitarian evangelicals and they would write substantive stuff, but it was all about exegesis. So it was all about, right. this is how we interpret the Bible correctly, right? So there wasn't a lot of theological richness, right? Because it was still very, you know, because that's for, for an evangelical, that's like, that's what you got to do. You got to really wrestle with scripture. Um, and that's important work, but I think I wanted more, but I had no idea about the Catholic right. tradition on this at all. So wanting more substance, wanting something more theological and philosophically rich, I thought the only other game in town was just, you know, like feminist theology and feminist philosophy, which again, tends to be much more suspicious toward divine revelation and scripture and seeing those things not as authoritative, but primarily as man-made and emphasis on the man, <laughs> man-made, you know? And, um, you know, there was like one semester when I was at Oxford as a junior undergrad, and I was doing a course on medieval women's writing, and I was reading Hildegard, Christine de Pizan, Julian of Norwich, and I was like, I loved it. I feel like I got this glimpse. It was like this kind of like world opened up, and I was like, this is amazing, you know? And But then it just, I didn't enter into it until over 10, you know, about 10 years later almost. Um I think I didn't quite realize that, oh, that tradition st is still exists, <laughs> you know, like it's not just this medieval thing, like there's st that thread has continued. Um, but I didn't, I didn't encounter that continuity until later. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So one of the goals of a show like this is to present kind of a Catholic view of gender. You know, for those non-Catholic listeners, those completely non-Christian listeners, I want to always be able to try to explain topics to that point of view. And I mentioned before, I, you know, I passed on your article from the Church Life Journal to so many people because it was just such a good explainer on the idea of gender and, and sexuality. And one of those things that I, I think in this term, thinking about gender, I mean, we are, we're consumers of, of Disney and Netflix. We read, we read books, we watch D debates or watch laws being passed and we hear about human rights being debated and 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 how news content is reported and all these things that we consume as as listeners of this show or consuming this this show right now it, it all, it's all coming through a lens and a, that lens has a certain understanding of gender and you know what what awoken in me when i i'm, I'm thinking about conversion to catholicism is i realized oh wait there's more paradigms out there than just evangelical mm -hmm. christianity well, there's more paradigms out there than just the Disney, Netflix, you know, uh, news media kind of paradigm that's reporting these things and and making these these shows and miniseries and and people writing books. There's a Catholic paradigm of gender that's different than I think the paradigm of gender that most people say in 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 Western world, uh, the modern world in quotes understand. And so what I what it your book does for me is it it says, hey, here's a different paradigm than the one maybe you're operating under and explains where this comes from and explains it really well. Um, can you do that for us here? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> can you give me a little bit, uh, in all seriousness, a bit of an explainer of, of how the, the current kind of paradigm of gender is different in a nutshell from how the Catholic Church understands gender. For the person who's just tuning in and going, like, what? What's the difference? How is it different? Mm -hmm. Sure. Right? You know what I mean? Right. So I think there's... There's a big difference. Um, and I think the way you explain that is really helpful um, because I don't know, sometimes I get, sometimes I'll, I'll get pushback, say from more progressive um, Catholics about my work and saying, no, we, you know, we just need to listen to trans people about this. Like we just need to listen to their experiences. And like, and I'm like, yes, we do. Absolutely. We should listen to people's experiences. But we also have to be attentive to the way that our experiences are filtered through interpretive frameworks. Right, yeah. So there, you know, it's not just this raw material. So there's a specific interpretive framework that has arisen in our culture that mediates or explains our experiences to ourselves. So there's, and then those those experiences can reinforce the framework as the framework kind of gives shape to those experiences or interprets them for us. Um, 
And so I think it's that framework that I really try to address in my work. Like, what exactly is this framework? What is it taking for granted? What is its view of the world? And so to do like a real rough sketch um, of the gender paradigm, as I call it in the book. So the gender paradigm, one, it w- it does it denies the idea of a creator. So it's it's either explicitly atheistic or implicitly atheistic. So there's no, or if there is some kind of deity, there isn't a, there isn't a creator who intentionally creates us and there isn't thus a created order and we're not creatures, right? So that's very different. Um, So in the gender paradigm, we are the creators. Like we are the ones who are responsible for our own self-determination, for our own meaning we don't receive our identity or our nature from the creator. We have to, cr- you know, um, we have to almost craft our own nature, right? So that's a that's a difference. Um, and so in the gender paradigm, me- any kind of meaning or categorization is seen as this con- this human construct, this process of human socializa- socialization, especially through language. And so how we do that work of creating is both technological, but it's also linguistic. It's also conceptual. So um, we can play with language because there isn't this intrinsic meaning, this givenness right. to the world. Like any kind of meaning in the world exists because of us. Um so that's that's a difference. And then freedom is conceived in this paradigm as that process of self-determination, that process of pushing beyond limits. Like that's what freedom is. It's surpassing our limits. Whereas from a Catholic perspective, freedom is found from a sense of belonging, from actually paying attention to our limits and trying to live within them, like in the context of this holistic created order of which we are a part. Um, and that God actually works through even our, our limits and flaws. They're not something to be conquered, right? But they're, um, so I would say that to even put it maybe in more of a nutshell, that the gender paradigm is try rejects the idea of nature as not just in like trees and bees, but like human nature. Like there's this, there's this nature to things and the good life is found through living in harmony with that, you know, which is a very, like, that's a very central idea in most ancient forms of thinking, like whether it's Stoicism, whether it's Taoism, whether it's, you know, just living in harmony with the way, the way, (laughs) you know, the Tao, um, rather than trying to fight it, fight against it. So um, those would be some and then within those different frameworks, and then that changes what gender and sex are, right? If gender and sex are just these arbitrary categories that have been imposed by human beings, then we can kind of reimagine what it means to be a woman. If, if a woman is just primarily a construct, then we can, you know, we can identify into that construct, right? So the view of the body then is different, right? Because of these things. So in a Catholic understanding, the body is sacramental. It's what reveals the person. It's a gift, um, and part of our, our being, right. To a human being is a unity of body and soul. We're not just a ghost in the machine, but in the gender paradigm, the body doesn't have an intr- intrinsic meaning. And it's, it's much more seen almost as this object. There's, it's more of a dualistic kind of framework. So, so talk to me through the idea of sex versus gender because, and you, you do this very well in the book, but again, I don't know that I've encountered uh, many people in, in any circles that I can think of. And I have different people in different circles, professional and, and private and friends and social places that really seem to use these terms consistently or <laughs> use these terms uh, uh, to, to mean the same thing sometimes. And we're, we're, we're often, I think, and I think you do a great job of, of trying to bring this conversation down to the same, the same level. We're often, I think, talking above or beside each other because we're just using these terms differently. So, I mean, wh- what do we mean when we talk about sex versus, versus gender? I know that there's mm-hmm. definitely Catholic implications of what those things mean and how we understand those, but is there a way to explain those, those two ideas and maybe how th- the world 
uses them versus how we in, in, in the Catholic Church would use those differently? Yes. I would say if there's one thing that I find consistently maddening, it is how <laughs> people use the terms sex and gender, even the phrase sex and gender. So sorry. let's start with, no, I do it too. I mean, it's, it's really, anyway, I'll get into it, but <laughs> Let's start with um, the classic second wave distinction, because that was really, really is the most prominent one for a long time. And there are still people, it's still in the air. So that that idea is basically that sex refers to biology and then gender refers to these cultural norms and expressions that we attach or associate with biology, right? So I'm female, the fact that my, you know, I'm wearing my hair this way or these earrings, that's gender, right? Whereas, you know, the fact that I have a uterus is sex. <laughs> but I live in a culture where, you know, females often express, you know, are that, that sex is expressed through these gendered norms, right? So that's sort of the, the traditional sex versus gender. And you still hear this, you still hear this idea, well, gender is just a social construct. Okay, so hold on to that thought for a second. Now we have this um, this new understanding of gender in what I call gender identity theory. And that is an idea, the idea that gender is a subjective sense of self as a man, a woman, or both, neither. And that's what gender is. So those are very different ideas. One is external, one is internal. One is comes through a process of socialization explicitly. One seems to almost be pre-social, so much so that a four-year-old can yeah. like realize this about himself, even though he's been socialized in the opposite way. There's this like gender, this like core that's real, that's not connected to his body that he can access um, and know somehow just through this sense of self. So those are two very different ideas. But what happens is... The super, it's so frustrating. It annoys me so much. Those two <laughs> concepts are like mashed together. Like if you look, for example, just one example, it's all over the place if you start paying attention, but the most recent associated press guidelines for writing about gender stuff, they, in their definition of what gender is, they have this, it's something like gender is a social construct that encompasses one's ex, you know, appearance, behavior, and internal sense of self. So it just kind of like shoves it all together into this one thing. But then, you know, scroll down a couple pages, it says gender identity, and it gives the definition that I just gave, and subjective sense of self also can just be called gender. So it's like, mm, okay, so those two things are actually saying very different things and making very different assumptions. Um, because if gender is just a social construct, then it actually doesn't make that much sense why we would block a 10 year old's puberty, you know, and consider really invasive medical procedures um, unless they're, you know, because, but that's not the language that's used for that. That's more the gender identity language, right? So there's a lot of conflation happening and to make it more complicated then what happens is you will hear people who are proponents of the gender paradigm say, it's important to make a distinction between sex and gender but then they will proceed to completely conflate sex and gender in a way that folds sex into gender. So they will say that someone's assigned gender is female, for example. Well, female is a word that used to indicate sex, but now basically any sex-based category is being attributed to gender, and then gender is being defined apart from the body. And so gender is just kind of this amorphous, yeah. like postmodern juggernaut word that just swallows all meaning. And, you know, it's like this eel that you can't quite grab with your hands. And so then it can almost mean anything you want it to mean. So it's just conceptually, it's just a hot mess. Yeah, it, <laughs> so. it, 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 it seems like that. It seems like that. And you kind of, I don't know, I kind of feel like, you know, I, I, maybe I'm very, very trusting towards authority more than I should be or, or I, I give you a benefit of the doubt more than I should. But I feel like somebody should be in charge of this, know what's going on and have some kind of overarching, uh, overarching idea 
like a gender czar you know what i mean like of, of what we're thinking and how we're processing things but i guess i'm a bit naive to think that there's there is like a narrative that the world is falling it seems like the, the narrative is kind of a bit bit lost in in this area yes certainly yes right there's no it there's is. no one yeah yeah and i i'm even like <sighs> The inconsistency seems so obvious to me and glaring like this yeah. gender is a social construct and gender is this like priest innate sense of self that I'm like, OK, this can't be as dumb as it sounds that these that there's this equivocation. Basically, that's what's happening. There's this equivocation between what gender is. It's like it's a social construct and it's this innate sense of self, you know, and then people just don't even really try to square that circle. But I just pull, you know, I, I have these gender textbooks from like major presses like Oxford university press. And so I pulled one off the shelf the other day and I was like, I'm going to look through here and see how they, and sure enough, like on page 20, it says, you know, gender is a social construct, blah, blah, blah. Like, and then, you know, flip, flip a few pages later, it starts talking about transgender identities. And then it's like gender identity is an innate sense of self that, you know, I'm like, and there was no attempt to explain how those ideas cohere. Right. Cause you could, I mean, I can see making the argument that, well, of course we internalize social norms, right? We internalize social constructs all the time. That's sort of Judith Butler's point, you know, the kind of queen of gender theory. But the way people talk about gender identity isn't just an internalized, it's, that's what I'm, you know, that's why you can have a four-year-old boy who says he's a girl, even though he's been socialized as a boy, there's something, that innate sense of self that's more real, more real than the body, you know, that that's what gender really is. And that is very different from the idea that gender is a social construct. So anyway, but I need, I want to write more about this because it's driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Yeah, you're getting crazy. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not being cordial enough. That's okay. It's okay. I uh, I wonder how the church, or I shouldn't say the church, how, how we as Catholic Christians respond to this kind of thing. How do we how do we understand, or how do we, I guess, first of all, dialogue cordially with, with somebody who Come, who is in this kind of paradigm, right? That paradigm that, that seems a little bit confused or a little bit inconsistent about gender and, and sex and gender identity. How do we make sure we're talking on the same plane as Catholics to explain what, what the, the, the church believes, what we as Catholics believe? Is there a, mm -hmm. how do we make that bridge there, that connection? Well, you know, if you're, if you're trying to have an honest conversation with someone about this, you know, I would ask to define terms. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, like sometimes, and I can tell this sometimes too, like if I'm, I remember in one of my interviews or something, someone asked, well, you know, I keep hearing gender is a spectrum. Is gender a spectrum? And I was like, well, do you mean gender or sex? Because <laughs> I would answer those questions differently, you know, like, um, so I think if someone, yeah, if you hear someone say like gender is a social construct, you're like, okay, what do you mean by gender? Like, what, do you, you know, explain this, you know, just ask questions, um, like yeah. what, what do they actually mean? Um, define your terms. I think I think when it comes to like the law and policy, it should all be sex based, especially if it's dealing with anything where physiology matters, like sports or prisons or you know, just legal protections, right? Like those that should just be sex based, honestly. Um, because it doesn't there's no reason to divide sports teams by, inner senses of self, right? Like there's no reason to divide it like that. Um, the there's, there's a logic to divide it according to physiology, however. So it seems like, okay, that should be sex-based. But um, when it, but yet I do think that sex is like not, it, the thing that I think gender could be, if it were correctly understood, if gender is seen as, if sex is seen as this biological level, and then gender is the personal level that includes the biological, but also the spiritual, also the sociocultural, then it could actually be a really helpful concept. Like if, if gender is still connected to generation, like that's the root of the word, gens, um, then I think gender can be used helpfully. But it, it's, it's such a messy word right now that every time I use it, I kind of cringe because I'm like, uh, you know, it's so hard to be, make yourself understood because people hear, I say the word gender and you, they might hear, they might think 10 different things. 
Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, look, I'm going to get feisty here for a minute, uh, even Don't though it's, it. it's the, the cordial Catholic. The feisty because, Catholic tonight. Yeah, That's yeah, what we're be, doing. I should re, <laughs> rename the show just this episode, and then I'll get just back for, on it. Just for my, my interview. Yeah, I, I like it. I, I mean, I, I think oftentimes and the Catholic response to this is just to double down on this idea that, no, men are men, women are women. This this very kind of uh, harkens back to a different time kind of idea of, of gender roles and gender, you know, sexuality that, that I don't know, it's, it's tough to uh, present that to the world in a, in a kind and, and cordial way. Like it's, it's an over response in, in my, in, and I'll leave my cards on the table here. Honestly, I'm a guy who has taken off time to be at the kids when they were young, but I've taken, mm-hmm. you know, paternity leave. I've taken them to school and I, you know, I would drive them around in, in the, in the minivan. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think, and I'm saying that because I think there's a response sometimes that's like, okay, the, this gender spectrum thing is confusing. I'm a Catholic man. I'm a Catholic woman. These are our clearly defined roles, and I think that is is the wrong response. Like an over an over response. Is that? I'm getting I'm getting fighty, but does that make any sense? It's so funny. You're so Canadian because you're still being so oh, nice. I feel really fighty though. <laughs> Aren't I being rude? No, you're not. I think I um. <laughs> Yes. I mean, I, I think too often that's those reactions are just the different, it's just two sides of the same coin, right? right? Because okay. it's still defining what a man is and what a woman is in more external things like appearance or roles, you know, whether you work inside the home, whether you work outside the home, right? These things that are in some cases kind of arbitrary depending upon what country you were born into or, you know, just things that are outside of our control. Right. But from a Catholic understanding, if womanhood and manhood are always grounded in the body, like that's the ground of what it means to be a woman. That's the ground of what it means to be a man. And then masculinity is the living out of being a male human being in the world. So that can look many different ways. Right. Um, but I think it's really important that we, that gender is always refers to persons, not to traits, not to roles, not to outfits, you know, but that, um, that it's about, it's really fundamentally about embodiment because even, you know, my husband has been a stay at home parent for a while too. And um, when he, when he's parenting, he's still doing that as a man that is still an expression of his fatherhood and his masculinity. Right. And, you know, when I do things like mow the lawn, which I recently (laughs) discovered is actually kind of enjoyable. (laughs) I went to like 38 years, not mowing a lawn. And I was like, Oh, it's kind of, kind of satisfying. Um, (laughs) But it's not like I'm suddenly masculine, you know, like I, I, that's a feminine action because I'm a, I am a female person. I that's doing it. I'm a, a female body that's doing it. So um, I, I, yes, I, I think that reactions against this stuff, while they might be understandable, um, they often overcorrect by reinforcing some of the same stereotypes that both sides agree to, you yeah, know, that, yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's, yeah, thank you. That's, that's well said. And I think it's, it's hard for me. And I think people who are looking into the Catholic church who are, just moderate people, reasonable Christians who are kind of living life and trying to follow Christ uh, and, and live well, live live peaceably, to find this kind of middle ground of what the church kind of actually presents. Because I feel mm-hmm. like there's on one side this idea, you know, on social media of, okay, we have the, the experiences matter, we'll honor those, that's the important thing. And kind of stretching, stretching the church's teaching as far as it can possibly go to say it's the experience of what matters, and that's fine. You know, everything mm-hmm. else that we believe as Catholics in the Catechism and the church has passed on through tradition, it, it can be it can be molded or malleable, but it's experience that matters, mm-hmm. right? And, and and bringing people in without really explaining what the church teaches in an honest and earnest way. I think I think that's maybe one one side. And the other side is this extreme overreaction on on the other side. So I feel like it's just hard to find. I mean, gosh, the people that I've on both sides have to had to mute on Twitter because I can't stand the the, the back and forth or either mm-hmm. of these sides. I feel like I'm trying to 
you know, read the catechism, read the tradition, understand the Catholic faith as a, as a Catholic who honestly seeks just the middle ground of what the church actually mm-hmm. teaches. And there's these loud voices on both sides that are really pushing the envelope on, on both, on both sides. So honestly, you to me seem like the person who's just trying to live with the faith and present this in a reasonable way. I don't know if that's, the middle ground is the right way of saying that, but how do we find that? Like, how do we, mm-hmm. other than just reading all your books and just whatever you put out, we just, we just read and consume it. <laughs> then we're a weird oh, cult. Oh, man. But, but, <laughs> yeah, don't do that. You know what I mean? Like, it, it seems like with the noise of social media, there's just not that, that middle yeah. ground easily found, right? Of just actual what the church teaches. Yeah. I I joined Twitter in, I don't know, like a year ago, a <laughs> year and a half ago, something like that, maybe a year ago. And at first I was like, okay, I'm going to like really carefully curate who I follow yeah. so that it's really balanced, you know? And I still think that's in general, a good rule. But then I quickly realized like, oh, this is just this. I, I, I kind of had this realization like, oh, I actually shouldn't be, I shouldn't form myself through Twitter at all. Like that should not be my goal. <laughs> right. Like, and so I'm realizing that that, that doesn't have this magical effect of like, you know, listening to kind of two two divisive like voices who happen to be on opposite sides does not actually help for me as a moderate necessarily. (laughs) So I think that we have to be formed by things not on social media. Right. So, and what everything I think, like I, I have really been formed by reading thoughtful Catholics, you know, um, like John Paul II, (laughs) <laughs> Edith Stein, you know, Sister Prudence Allen, like there are a lot of substantive measured voices out there that don't get caught up in the polarized insanity. Um, Cause that's really what the problem, you know, it's just this political polarization that's kind of ripping both of our countries yeah, yeah, asunder. Yeah. And then it just gets, you know, the faith gets translated through that framework, right? There's another, you know, kind of interpretive framework, right? So um trying to not get sucked into that particular framework. And it's, it's difficult, but it's really important, I think. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I think so too. Uh, you, you talk a, a, in a chapter called Artifice about uh, transgender ideas. And I think this is so, uh, it's so interesting. You mentioned your own experience with puberty, which is hilarious. And I won't bring that up. I mean, it, it's really, really funny and awkward to read. I, lo- I, I love that. But, you know, I've had, I, listeners uh, reach out to me to cover topics like this and your name always comes up so i'm glad you i'm glad you came back and made time for us thank you because this is such a i don't know phenomenon such a huge growing thing i mean i can i i i had a had a listener write in with uh details on on a survey of a local school board who who uh, surveyed kids in that school board, and something like seventy five percent of the of the high school students in that school board reported that they didn't match their given like gender mm-hmm. identity. Like seventy five percent are self reporting mm-hmm. this, which was just hard to understand. I mean, as a you know, from a statistics point of view, I, I'd like to. That's confusing. Th- those numbers don't seem like like how was that survey done? There's a lot of questions with, with with that. But I mean, it seems like something is going on here. That's really uh, a phenomenon like really mm-hmm. seriously sweeping through society in, in a really serious way like and I, and I don't think that I really recognized that until I saw things like this mm-hmm. that that the, the, the kids that are being formed under this kind of paradigm well a lot of them feel like they're really confused or don't seem to match what you know their 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 biology is saying or, or mm-hmm. you know I don't know I'm using the wrong words probably but what are we uh, to, to make of this with as and respond to this kind of thing as as Catholic Christians, like what do we do with this? Because it seems, I don't know, big like a, a real thing going yeah. going on. It is a real thing, <laughs> and it's a big thing. <laughs> it is this. It's really remarkable to look at the numbers, you know, of just how much exponential increase there has been in oh. young people, especially. Um, experiencing gender incongruence or identifying as trans or non-binary. My guess is in that 75%, there's probably a large number of those that are not necessarily identifying as trans, but it's more, you know, about 
gender nonconformity, being maybe right, genderqueer yeah. or non-binary and basically just like, I'm not cis, you know, whatever. I, you know, I'm not cisgender. I'll be anything but that. Um, so I think for a lot of these kids, um, it, it will be a phase. Um, what worries me and the reason why I've, I've really invested a lot of time writing about this in a serious way is that, you know, there have always been different kind of um, social pathologies among teenagers and adolescents, right? Especially females. Like this is not something new in that sense um, that adolescents under distress tend to externalize that distress in some way. Um, whether it's, you know, anorexia or self-harm, you know, but what's, what's frightening about this is that for the first time we have all the adults in the room, all the people who should know better, right. the yeah. doctors, the therapists, the teachers, the parents, in some cases, all echoing back and mirroring back. Yes, this, this is, you're, this is exactly right. This is, this framework is right. And let's go on a path of medicalization because that's what worries me because if, if, if a young person is ushered into a path of irreversible medicalization as a minor, then it can't just be a phase, yeah, right? right? Like it will, it's not something that you can come back from, you know, it's not like being goth for a couple of years. Um, and that's what really worries me, right? Because this, I think there's a mental health, I mean, there is a mental health crisis among teenagers, like that's well documented, yeah. just rates of anxiety and depression were already, you know, just skyrocketing before COVID even accelerated the phenomenon. Um, so young people are not doing well. But now we have this framework that's, you know, being imposed on a whole range of different circumstances, kinds of distress, discomfort. I mean, what person going through puberty doesn't feel at odds with their body, right? That's a very, especially, you know, young women, like f accepting one's body as a woman is like, it's a hard fought battle. You know, it's a hard won battle in our culture. Um, but now there's this interpretive framework that's saying, oh, this is what you feel. Then this is what you are. And here's how to fix it. Here's right. the solution to your suffering everything, all the kinds of distress you're feeling right now is all about this one thing. And if you just fix that thing, then you'll be happy. I mean, it's a really compelling story. Um, but the problem is it's based on n very low quality, flimsy scientific evidence and a false understanding of the human person, a fragmented understanding of the human person. And so it does, it does further damage to these young people. That's why I write about this stuff. It's not because I don't like trans people. It's actually because I, I care about yeah, them. Right. And I think that they deserve better care that um, is not just driven by ideology. Um, and, you know, as part of my research, like I've read the studies, like I've read them all and there's just, you know, the, the simplistic narrative that, that this kind of medicalization um, solves this, solves gender dysphoria is, um, is just not well supported. You know, the, the supposed benefits are, don't outweigh the clear risks. And it's, it's not good, especially when we're talking about young people. Like we're talking about minors, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, is is there a, a clear reason why it seems like this is being accepted if the evidence and the research is not, is is as poor as you say? Like why, you know, we're, we're supposed to be a science-based a science -based society, right? I mean, we, we mm -hmm. the new atheists ushered in this this era of, of God is dead because science is, is the thing, right, that wins the day. So why does it seem so unscientific that, is is there a reason why is there a hmm. i i mean i think it's that the there's a you know one thing everything's become politicized right right and so this issue specifically um it's being seen as this urgent and politicized matter and so mm -hmm. i think even people who are operating out of goodwill <laughs> um 
you know, it's like they have these kind of blinders on, you know, and it's actually, it's fascinating sometimes to read some of the studies where you'll read a study and you'll, you know, they'll find some kind of shred of low quality evidence, like, Oh, like this factor is approaching statistical significance, you know, and then they'll kind of in the discussion leap to this grandstanding about like transphobic le legislation. And it's like, but, that's not what a scientific article right, should be doing. Right. Like you should just be looking at the evidence. And so there is this, um, yeah, there's this healthy skepticism that should be present is absent on this, in this issue. Um, and I think, you know, in Europe, things are, things are changing. So a lot of European countries that have been down this road for a while are now changing their therapeutic approaches to young people. Um, Sweden, the UK, France, Finland, all like just most of them just in the last couple of years have done independent reviews of the evidence and have concluded that, um, yeah, that the risks do not weigh out, outweigh the, the supposed benefits or vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But America's just like on oh, Canada, man, let me yeah, tell you, Canada no. is the worst of them all. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> there's just, just recklessly going yeah. ahead. And I think it's, um, certainly in an American context, I think because it's now politicized and it's now, it's now it's like, you're on your tribe's side. Like, that's what it is. Like, Oh, I'm a progressive. And so this is how my tribe right. sees it. And that's like this tribal loyalty. Um, and you know, people just dig their heels in and you know, you only listen to the voices that echo back what you want to hear. And yeah. yeah, yeah. Is there a singular Catholic response to this, to the transgender uh, uh, movement phenomenon? I don't know that that's, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I mean, I don't want to downplay this as a phenomenon. People are experiencing this. There's, there's, there's something happening here. I don't want to minimize the experience of those people, but by, by calling it a phenomenon or something, that, that seems rude. And I'm, I'm cordial. So, so, <laughs> so is there a Catholic response to, to, uh, to somebody who, who says, I'm transgendered, I'm, I'm doing this surgery, I'm, I'm taking these pills, I'm changing, I'm, I'm changing my identity, my, my biology, I'm having these surgeries. Is there a Catholic response to those kinds of, in those kinds of conversations? Well, like there's, I, there's yeah. the tribal response. I get that. Like, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a, yeah, a, a mm -hmm. healthy thing. Is, is there a, a healthy response? Yeah. Well, I think, so. I think so for sure. I mean, I think there's, there's different layers to this question, right? Because there's the, there's like the bioethical question, right? So yes, Catholic bioethicists have written about this um, from that perspective. So you can, you can address the question there and that will be more about, you know, philosophical and theological anthropology, anthropology and principles and medical evidence, right? That question. Yeah. But then you have like the pastoral level um, and that's different, right? That's, yeah. that's interpersonal, right? So I think when it comes to the pastoral level, um, there isn't just one response because there isn't just one person yeah, going yeah, through yeah. this, right? Like each person who's going through this, um, you know, it, there's no one like monolithic trans experience. So, you know, it really requires an attention to the person and what they're going through. And, you know, it's like, like that question Jesus likes to ask people, like, what are you looking for? Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. he, that's what he wants to know. And, um, so I think that the the path of accompaniment is the response, right? Which is hard because it's it's play in the long game. It it's patient. It's a little more hands off. It's a little more like docile to the spirit, um, while also having a specific direction, which is more you know a journey toward the father, like to, yeah. you know, into truth. Right. So it's not, I mean, Pope Francis talks about accompaniment, like, and he uses these words, he says, it's not a sort of therapy supporting self-absorption. So it's not accompanying someone is not just saying, tell me, you know, tell me your experience and I will just affirm absolutely everything. Right. So accompaniment can include like accompaniment is basically like, I'm with you in this, I'm here. And you know, sometimes we might disagree, but if yeah. we do, it's because I care about your ultimate good, but whatever happens, I'm still going to be here. I'm not going to reject you. And, you know, I'm, I'm here with you as you like discern this. And, um, 
we might disagree, but I love you nonetheless. You know, I mean, that seems to be more of the, the kind of pastoral response. I think it's also helpful in discerning how to approach accompaniment to consider one's role or sphere of responsibility toward another person. So if you're a teacher, for example, especially of minors versus maybe if you're teaching adults, I think that's an important distinction because I think parents of minors, teachers of minors should be more cautious in um, unthinkingly affirming this stuff because of the risk of unnecessary medicalization of a young person, right? So I think they're, you know, the stakes are higher in some ways there. Um, I think also, you know, if like a, a priest has a different role of responsibility toward a parishioner than I would as a fellow parishioner, like as a fellow parishioner, you know, <laughs> I actually went to mass the other day and there was a, a trans identified man who was sitting like two pews ahead of me. Um, you know, so he was, you know, presenting as a woman and, you know, he looked very nice. He had this nice suit on, his nails were done. And, um, and, you know, he left right before the end of mass. Otherwise, you know, my plan was to just go and introduce, you know, just say, hi, we're new here. What's your name? And that would have been it. Like I would, you know, yeah. Um, because it's not, he's not under like, my authority or something. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. um, and I want, like when I see a trans person in mass, like I want to make sure that they are recognized, recognized and welcomed, yeah. you know? And, um, cause that's what it is in some ways. It's like, you know, Jesus is like calling people to himself. And so Jesus is, Jesus is calling all, all he's calling trans people to himself. And so in some ways, what we need to do is just not get in the way of that, you know, yeah. not mess it up. Yeah. But. And I, I think, I mean, that's, that's so, that's so well said. And so I think wise to point out, uh, Abby, uh, that, yeah, I mean, that person's not under your authority, your teaching authority, your pastoral authority, your, you're, you're a fellow parishioner. And gosh, I think like that response of accompaniment is, is, is beautiful, right? When you understand it's not just going to mean them being a set, them just, uh, as you said, as you quoted Pope Francis, them just going into themselves and just talk about themselves all the time. You're, you're accompanying them. You're walking with them. You're a person in that relationship. You might disagree, you, but you have these conversations and uh, walking toward, you know, with that goal in mind of, of of bringing them to Christ, bringing them to the Father. I just think of of my experiences with like anxiety and sometimes crippling mm -hmm. anxiety. I think of how hard that is for somebody who's who's in a body that they feel like is not the body that, that, that fits them. Like that's a that's a difficult experience. Mm -hmm. And that accompaniment that 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 is that is the thing versus mm -hmm. I, I don't know what else you do. You you, you you know, look the other way, you, you yell at them, you give them some pamphlets or something like you, you mm -hmm. live your, you live your life on the attack, on the assault against mm -hmm. this other camp that's not you, right? I think that versus the accompaniment response, right, of understanding of a of, of place of empathy. I mean, that's, that's the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I want to, I want to end with just one thought, because you talk about this in, in the book, Talk about the, 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 the Catholic Christian holds a twofold truth, you say, the dignity of every human being and the dignity of the, the sex human body, and that the transgender anthropology requires the rejection of one of these truths. Can we explore that for a minute? The idea that you know, the Catholic Church holds this one idea, the transgender anthropology requires the rejection of, of you know, one of those truths the Catholic Church holds. So mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we grapple with that, I guess? Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, I think, I think what I'm saying there, I'm like, wait, what did I, I say? I think I, I think I just probably misquoted you terribly. <laughs> no, I'm like, what did I write again? <laughs> uh, well, it sounds like uh, a transgender anthropology rejects the, the dignity and inherent meaning of the sex body, right? Because it, it kind of, I mean, another way of putting it might be um, the sacramentality of the body, because the, in a Catholic understanding the body is a sacrament that reveals the person, right? It's through my body that the, the invisible world of my thoughts and who I am and my personhood are made manifest in order for me to have community with others. Um, and so the body's always doing that. Like the body doesn't have to be forced to do that. And so I think that 
what I hear in some transgender narratives is this desire for that sacramentality, is a desire for the body to reveal the person. But I think the difference is that in Catholicism, like because our bodies are gifts from the creator, that the body we have is already serving that sacramental function. Um, and so I think a, a rejection of the body or a rejection of the body as a gift, as having an inherent dignity and meaning that is at, at odds with a, with a Catholic understanding of anthropology. But as far as then how to kind of navigate that with someone, well, I mean, in some ways I think about, I mean, this isn't that unlike um, interacting or engaging with someone from a different philosophical or religious perspective, right? Like they're, they're coming at it from a different perspective. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, have, have community with that person, have relationship with that person, treat them with love and respect. And, you know, if the door opens, have rich theological conversations with them. Um, so yeah, in some ways I think, I don't know. I just, I think we need to give people space to go toward the truth slowly. You know, I think human beings are really impatient especially when like we've had a, a powerful conversion and we like want other people to be yeah. converted now, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you know, my own conversion was, you know, I, I became, I became Catholic still, you know, that like when I first joined the church, there were parts of the creed I wouldn't say, yeah. you know? Um, and there was no one like coming at me hard saying like, <laughs> mm, I heard you didn't say that line in the creed. Like you shouldn't be going to commute, you know, it's just, so I was, I was given space to kind of wrestle through with some of this. But then when I would go to my, you know, Catholic friend and be like, okay, what's the deal with this contraception thing? Um, they would answer honestly. And yeah. sometimes I didn't like that answer. Sometimes I would be like, I don't like that. You know, I don't agree with that. But they told me, you know, they answered my question and they, it didn't change their attitude toward me whatsoever. Um, so that when I think about that experience, that to me seems to be a model of accompaniment, you know, yeah. just having building a relationship with someone, a rapport. And then if, you know, the conversation gets theological, speaking honestly, but lovingly and and then letting that person, you know, um, think about what you said. Um, so there's no quick fix, you know, yeah. there's no yeah. quick fix with the human heart. That's not how these things work. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> well said. Uh, the book is The Genesis of Gender from Ignatius Press. Uh, it's fantastic. So thank you again for putting those uh, thoughts onto paper. Yeah. Uh, do you want to point anybody to anybody else? Do you want to point people anywhere else to, to find your stuff or to follow you? Uh, where, where should they go? <laughs> On Twitter, obviously, to follow you because you love being there. I don't know, man. I, I always hate this question because I'm like, I, I, I can't in good conscience, like encourage someone to follow me on Twitter. You know, it's like, I don't know if you're already on Twitter and you're yeah. bored, yeah. you can follow me. I do try to post when I write something, I do try to post it there. So that is one way to follow my writing. Um, but that's the only social media imprint I have. I'm really, I try to not get too deep in that stuff, but um, yeah. So well, that sounds great. Well, your books are on Amazon uh, or from Ignatius Press. Uh, people mm -hmm. can find them, find them there. Yep. Uh, and they're they're great. Uh, thank you for coming back after all these years. All these, uh, to this, all these years. <laughs> sounds, You've yeah. grown. So. Yeah, I've grown. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what, that's what COVID does to you. <laughs> I know, right? We're like these haggard, you know, like, oh, oh man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's about, that's about right. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for being here. Uh, yeah. I want to say, you know, God bless you and the work you're doing. Uh, thanks for being a place that people can uh, to come to read the, what, uh, you know, uh, a well-reasoned and informed uh, view of these things uh, in a place there's a lot of noise and a lot of chatter and a lot of, uh, I don't want, can I say crap on this show? I guess it's my show. I could say crap. Oh my gosh. To, you are just l letting loose I don't think, tonight. I told you, I, I, I feel a little bit fighty. Yeah, Cordial is, no more. Whew, yeah. Man, I'll have to mark this episode explicit, I think, and apologize <laughs> in advance when I record. Please do. The intro. Oh, I love sorry, it guys. so much. Oh yeah, my gosh. I'm really sorry. Thanks for being here. Abby. Yeah. I really appreciate it. It's, it's, it's been great. So thank, yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you. All right. Bye. Take care.